Hello, everyone. I am pretty far away today, so hopefully we got this going good. Zoom sometimes is tricky. If we if we didn't notice that already this morning, <laughs> um, I met Dr. J. B. a while back. She's an amazing lady. She has been a blessing to me. We studied together at the National Speakers Association Speakers Academy. And when she heard about what we did, she wanted to come aboard and just let y'all hear the message that she has for us. And I kind of heard her message a little bit. It's amazing. But Dr. JB, I, I call her Dr. JB. Her name is Naomi. And I hope I say your last name correct. Jean Baptiste. Okay. Uh, she's a first generation Haitian immigrant currently residing here in Florida. And she's a board certified emergency room physician. She completed her bachelor of science degree in psychology first from Duke University and then obtained her doctors of medicine degree at Duke University. She moved to New York City where she completed a residency program in emergency medicine at New York Presbyterian. In addition to being a physician, She's a wife, a mother of two children, CEO and founder of Hope for Med, a global wellness company exclusively for healthcare professionals. She's a podcast host, a YouTuber, and of course, a public speaker. Her favorite activity is connecting with others and helping them realize their unlimited potentials. And she's a great person. I really, I really adore her. So Dr. JB, I'm gonna let you take the lead on this and share, share with us all. I think I was on mute. <laughs> all right, so again, Angela, thank you so very much for that kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to really just connect with you guys and, and share a little bit about me, a little bit about my story and my journey. Um, I want this to be informal, really. This is not a lecture. It's a conversation that we're going to be having uh, with each other. So feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions along the way. It's fine. You're not going to detract me too much because I'm really just telling you my story. So I'll, I'll remember my, my story and my journey. So don't worry about that. Um, number two is my, I'm a mother of two young children and my son is sick. So it's very possible that I might get interrupted. You might see him on the screen. Um, so, you know, just be prepared if the little boy shows up on the screen that um, it's my son that's sick right now. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, you know, Today's conversation, I've really been thinking about it. Um, and, you know, I decided I, I really want to talk about impossible dreams, right? What is your impossible dream? And, um, and we're going to go ahead and circle back to that at the end of my, um, my speech, because I do want to hear, you know, what's your impossible dream? Because, because step one for accomplishing your impossible dream is stating it, is sharing it, is putting it out there into the world right? Announcing it, right? Because not only, um, you know, the, the, the path of announcing it kind of, you know, holds you a little bit accountable, but it also creates a community that can also support you, right? So if we know what is your dream, then we can think about, you know, what are things or who do we know who could help you accomplish this impossible dream? And so when I think about an impossible dream, I really mean like, what's your reach? Like, what do you really, really want in your life? Um, so let's go ahead and get started with my story. The beginnings. I was not born in the United States. I was born in Haiti. So I am a first generation immigrant. And I don't know if any of you guys know anything about Haiti, um, but it is a poor country in the Caribbean. We are connected to the Dominican Republic and truthfully it's night and day. Um, you fly to the Dominican Republic, it's like lush and green and you know, and it looks so nice. And then you drive across the border and then you see, you know, uh, tons of erosion and um, my son. Hey, hi, hi. All right, so like, I, I already forewarned you guys that my son might be interrupting us. What's wrong? I don't feel good hearing that. 
I'm still sick. Okay, sweetheart. No. Do me a favor. Why don't you go lay down with Dada? Okay? My mommy finished her meeting. Okay? Okay. All right. Sleeping is also a little I don't really like how I know sleep. you don't like sleeping, but go lay down. All right. Okay. I'm going so, down. again, uh, interruption, but I can continue where I left off. So, just a quick, just a quick note. Haiti is probably poorer than Uganda. I wouldn't doubt very much that it's poorer than Uganda. So you can, you'll be able to relate to what she's talking about because she has come from very uh, poverty-stricken area of the world. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Very much so. So um, I have traveled to Uganda, and we'll get to that later on in my in my story. But you know, if you think about Uganda, um, you know, and and the roads, well. Kampala is developed, but there are still areas in Kampala where you have like the 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 reddish dirt road. You know what I'm talking about? That if you take a little piece of that and you plop it down in the Caribbean, that's Haiti, right? Like it looks very much like a little piece of Africa just plopped in in to the Caribbean, but it's much, much poor. It's very, very poor. So here we are, we're in this, I was born in that island, that poor island, but I was also born poor in that poor island. And, um, you know, while my early memories, um, I don't really have a lot of early memories there, but I hear the stories of my mom. And my mom, I'm the youngest of six children, and my mom always talks about, you know, what the neighbors would say as she's popping out kids you know, child after child after child. And like, you know, why are you poor lady having all these children? How are you gonna feed your children? And they would ridicule her. Um, you know, my birth history um, goes something like this. My mom, I have my the oldest, my oldest sister is the oldest, her name is Rachel. And then after my oldest sister, we had, my mom had another daughter. Um, but that daughter died um, when she was a toddler in Haiti. And so my sister kept asking my mom to have another daughter. And my mom kept trying to have another daughter. And after giving birth to three boys on their last try, I was born and then it ended. And so I'm the baby of the family. My sister's the oldest, you know, I believe that story because there was nobody that came after me. So that really makes a lot of sense. So, you know, my mom ended up giving birth to a total of five children in that poor country, uh, which we were very poor. Um, but my mom always strove to do two things. One was put food on the table. Two was keep a shelter over our head. And that was her goal. And so when we, you know, immigrated from Haiti into the U.S., that continued being my mom's goal. So some people think, oh, you know, you make it out of Haiti and you, you enter into the U.S., you're in this, you know, first world country, life is great. The U.S. is full of gold everywhere, right? Um, but the reality of the situation is that, no. The U.S. is not full of gold. Life is not easy. And life is not easy for an immigrant in the U.S. Um, and so my mom was a housekeeper. So she worked minimum wage as a housekeeper. And my father was a minister. Um, and so my father, you know, really dedicated his life to, to ministry. And so he didn't necessarily keep a regular job. So our livelihood was based off of my mom's minimum wage. Um, feeding five children. And so, of course, um, we were poor. We were poor in the U.S. We were poor in Haiti and came into the U.S. and we were still poor. Um, but as a child, I didn't really realize that I was poor, right? Because my mom's ma mission was to keep food on the table and shelter over our heads. Well, one thing for sure, your mom is an amazing lady. <laughs> so yeah, so we were saying, my mom always tried, said, what? Food on the table, shelter, roof over our heads. That was her mission. And she accomplished that, right? So I wasn't, we were, you know, we were going to the thrift stores to get our back to school shopping. You know, we didn't get a lot of, we didn't actually celebrate the holidays. So I didn't get like Christmas presents or anything like that. But I never went hungry and I never didn't have shelter. So, um, but I grew up very, very, um, in a very strict religious household. And my father was a minister. We were in church all the time. We went to church 
uh, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Tuesday nights, Friday nights, uh, church band practice on Saturdays. Um, and sometimes he would throw in stuff, stuff in the middle. But the one thing that um, they really valued was education. Um, you know, my parents always said that they, you know, left Haiti to, you know, try to give us a better, a better life and really, really stress education. So much so that the only reason we would ever be able to miss service was if it was something school related. So I did really well in school. I was in everything, <laughs> you know? So um, if I had, I remember one Friday night, I was like, oh, mom and dad, I can't go to church because I have my science fair. It's tomorrow. You know, I had probably like months to prepare for, but the project was due tomorrow <laughs> and they let me stay home to do that project. That's how important school was. Um, and so, you know, because of that and because they stressed the importance of school, you know, um, we did well in school. Um, but my parents, they didn't go to college. My, my dad never made a college in, you know, Haiti, right? We were poor. My mom didn't even finish high school in Haiti. But my sister, the oldest of us, got accepted into college. And, you know, and there's like a 10 year gap between me and my sister. And so when she got into college, it was like, oh, she can go to college, so can I. I can go to college too, right? And so, you know, I guess one moral from this is it's important to have somebody that you can look up to, right? And it doesn't have to be somebody in your, your family, right? Immediate family or whatnot. But, you know, when you think about your impossible dream, you know, do you know anybody who's actually accomplished this impossible dream, you know, that you can try to emulate and, you know, learn about how is it that they did this? Um, and what are some steps I can do to really, you know, go down the path of, of my impossible dream? So, with my sister going into college, you know, that really showed us that we can, even though we're poor in the in US and my parents can't pay not one penny for me to go to college, my sister was able to do it so I can do it too. And so, um, so because of that, I never really doubted my ability to get into college. Now, my struggles. So even though I did well in school, I was a pretty bad test taker. I, 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 I'm not horrible, but I'm definitely one that will like barely pass the standardized test. Other tests, I'm good. Standardized test, it was like a skill that I never quite understood how to do it. And so um, I didn't score that well on tests. Um, and, but I was very active in school. And so when you think about like a, a well, like uh, diverse uh, resume, I had that. I didn't have the test scores. Like I wasn't acing the, the standardized test, you know, but I was in clubs, I was in sports and I had good grades. Um, and so even though my weakness was standardized tests, I was able to balance, right, the rest of my application with other things, right? So another moral, you're not going to be great at everything, right? You need to figure out what your strengths are and really, you know, strengthen your strengths, right? Focus more on your strengths and your weaknesses. Truthfully, you can spend all this energy and these weaknesses and they're not going to get better, but you can actually get better on your strengths. Um, and so, and that was kind of my focus was like, you know, I like people. I like getting involved in things. So I'm going to go ahead and keep getting involved in more activities and more activities and whatnot. So I was able to make it into college. Again, my parents didn't pay nothing. I got into college with um, a combination of scholarships and, and loans. Um, and so then medical school, hmm. another, I'm not a great test taker, but again, I did well in my classes, right? And then, um, and because my, my, my application was, was richer on other things, I was able to go ahead and enter into medical school. So in medical school, it was to the summer of 2008. So that was between the, my first year of medical school, medical school's four years. It was between my first year of medical school and my second year that summer. My sister, she became an epidemiologist, studied epidemics. And at that point she was like traveling um, to different countries. So I would visit her. That was my opportunity. That's how I got to travel because I had a place to stay. So I you know, would visit my sister. And during that time, she happened to be in Uganda. 
And so I was like, ah, I'm going to go to Uganda, you know, via my sister. But when I get to Uganda, it was my whole summer. It was like six weeks. What am I going to do? So I went ahead and I researched um, uh, hospitals and, you know, different institutions that have projects in Uganda and just found the contact person and just sent a cold email introducing myself. And it went something, I don't remember the email, but it was something like, hey, I'm Naomi, I'm gonna be, I'm a medical student. I was the first year medical student there. I was like, I just finished my first year of medical school. I know you don't know me, I don't know you, but it looks like you're doing a project. Can you take any volunteers? I'm gonna be in Uganda, I can help out, right? And so I just sent that to any place that I, any institution I found. And Johns Hopkins was doing a project called, you guys may or may not be familiar with this. Um, it was um, Young, Empowered, and Healthy, Project Yeah, or and Be a Man. It was um, um, focused on like HIV prevention, things like that. And they took me on and they said, sure, help out with our project. And so not only did I go to Uganda, but then as being a part of that project, I was actually able to travel around Uganda and I went to a variety of places. So my sister was in Kampala, um, but during those six weeks inter in um, uh, period, and this is a long time ago. So pardon me if I like mess up, you know, you guys can correct me actually if I, if I mess up, but I went to Jinja, right? Um, Apache, A-P-C-H-E, I think. And so it's in the North, um, Mbara, I think. Um, and what what do you say? Mbarara. Mbarara, yes, that's where it was. Um, and then Kampala. And then we held um, you know, different trainings with the youth there. And one of the things that um one of the youth um told me, which really stayed with me, was he said that he has a, he had attended a lot of these trainings but he's never seen somebody that looks like him there doing the training. And that was really, really powerful for me. And that was why, like when Angela told me about this, I was like, oh, I need to do this, right? Because I wanted to have that opportunity to be here in front of you as a, you know, person of African descent um, who came from a poor country um, to be able to be here in front of you and say, hey, you can do it. I did it. I'm no different than you, right? Um, I had my impossible dream and I've strived, I've, I've worked hard to accomplish it, right? And I put my, my, my neck on the line, right? I took initiative to reach out to people, you know, and, and I got a lot of no's. I got a lot of no's, but you know what? It only takes one yes, right? If you could get a million no's, but one yes is enough, right? And that goes with everything you do. That goes with, you know, schools, right? You know, you can apply to a bunch of schools. They can all say no, but guess what? If you get that one yes, if you get that one yes to go to medical school, you're gonna be a doctor, right? Like it doesn't matter. You, you could have gotten 10 yeses. One yes and 10 yeses are actually the same because you are one person and you can only go to one thing, right? So, um, so yes, yeah, so that was my experience in, in Uganda. Um, there was, and, and I want you guys to tell me what this is, cause I don't remember, but I remember when I was walking to the, um, the office every morning, um, for project. Yeah. On the side of the road, I would encounter, um, somebody that would be making some food. Um, and it was like a roti and they would put eggs and then they would roll it up. What is that called? It was delicious. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's Wait, what a is... Rolex. 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 Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Rolex. Yeah. Rolex. Yeah. You know, tomatoes and um, uh, onions, something like that. Delicious. I've had one. They are great. They're delicious. So, anyways, um, so let's stop talking about food. I'm gonna get hungry. Um, so, what other things? So then, after Uganda, I went and I finished. Um, went back to medical school. So another pivotal thing that happened in my life was Haiti. Going back to Haiti, right? So, I the Haiti earthquake was a a life altering uh, experience for me. So that was back in 2010. I was a third year medical student then. 
And granted, I was born in Haiti. I had only gone back to Haiti one time. And that was my first year of medical school where I organized a trip for my um, colleagues to go back. That's a whole nother story. The second time I went back to Haiti was after the earthquake. And, you know, so then here I am in front of my computer saying, watching, right, all this, this misery in my country of birth. And I was like, I need to get down there. Did I know how I was going to get down there? Nope. Did I have money to get down there? Nope. I just said, I'm getting down to Haiti and I'm going to help out in this earthquake. And that I made that my determination, right? That was my impossible dream. I have no idea how it's happening, but I'm going to get down there. So when I put that out there, then I started what? Putting my neck out and just hang, hey, who's, you know, doing my research? Who's doing, um, you know, work in Haiti? And I reached out to them. I said, hey guys, I'm a third year medical student. I'm Haitian. I can speak Creole. I could be your interpreter. Can I go ahead and join your you know, mission trip to go down to Haiti? And one company said yes. So guess who was in Haiti a week later after making that determination? Me, right? And so, you know, thank you. So I was down there and, you know, working and I was the interpreter, but truthfully, my Creole is horrible. It was absolutely horrible, atrocious, but it was better than people who aren't Haitian and don't have any like small background. So, um, so, you know, I was the comic relief for the Haitian people, um, you know, who were there because they were just laughing at me. I was laughing at myself, but hey, we're communicating some way or another. Um, so, you know, that was a great experience. But the other great thing about that was I'm an emergency medicine doctor. And that was my turning point to make me turn into an emergency medicine doctor. Um, because before then, you know, I, I was interested in, you know, international medicine, I always was, but I was gonna go a whole different path to go down that path, like infectious disease, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I was in Haiti and I was at the clinics and I was seeing a variety of people coming in with all sorts of stuff. Like I was seeing kids, newborns, I was seeing pregnant women, I was seeing elderly patients, I was seeing people with broken bones and infected wounds and all sorts of things. And I was like, ah, oh, what kind of physician do I need to be to be able to respond in that time of need? And so when I was there, I was working with orthopedic surgeons, um, which are doctors like, you guys familiar with orthopedic surgeons, they focus on bones and, and things like that. Um, who else was down there? Um, there were some emergency medicine doctors. Um, and essentially what they said, what everybody said, and I kept asking, right? I was like, what kind of doctor? What, you know, what kind of doctor would be equipped with the skills to respond and do this? And they said, emergency. And I was like, oh, emergency. And so, and this is my third year in, in medical school. And, the, and what happens in third year medical school is when you start doing your applications and applying for residency, when you get to be like a junior doctor, essentially. So I had already started my application to go down this path of, oh, I'm going to do infectious diseases. But after the Haiti, the Haiti earthquake, I was like, oh, no, I'm going to do emergency. So I scrapped everything and started from scratch. So that's another thing, right? You don't have to be afraid to change your mind, right? Just because you said, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, and then something else happens and you are exposed to something different, don't feel obligated to continue going down this path. If that's not what you want to do anymore, change and go down another path, right? And so, and that's exactly what I did. I ripped up my, you know, internal medicine applications and I was like, I want to do emergency medicine. And I had never even done a rotation in emergency medicine. So, you know, to get into residencies, you have to do like, like two, three rotations. Like it's a, it's a very competitive field. So I was like, well, let me get my one rotation in and let me go ahead and talk about my Haiti experience because that's what made me want to do emergency medicine. And just like that, I was able to go ahead and um, get some interviews. Um, and then I made it into um, the ER residency program. Also during that, so after I came back from Haiti, um, so that was January, 2010, um, the summer before my fourth year of um of medical school there was a fellowship program called um global health fellows it was run through duke university which is where i go to school where i went to school and i was like you know what? i'm gonna apply for this program right whatever what's the worst thing that can happen what's the worst thing 
this question to you guys. What's the worst thing that can happen when you apply for something? You can get a no. They say no. They say no. They say no. Okay, so what? I've gotten plenty of no's, right? I've gotten plenty of no's, right? All I need is one yes, right? All I need is one yes. So I applied and I got it, right? So the Global Health Fellows gave you an opportunity to go and work in Geneva, Switzerland. And for the summer. And so this program, you go to Geneva. Um, of course, I still I still came from a poor background. I still had no money. And you know, none of those things change. Like none of those things change. Um, and so you you get this program and then you have to figure out how to get a flight over there and whatnot, right? And so when I was given the opportunity to to do this, first I had to, to find an NGO that would accept me to work with them. What was my impossible dream at that point? Hmm. I wanted to work at the World Health Organization. Right. I, you know, want to do the WHO. I'm going to be in Geneva. Why not the WHO? So, um, so what did I do? Right. I asked, right. I, you know, and the WHO is one of those things that you really have to like know somebody like really, you know, some things are about who, you know, um, I knew nobody, right? I'm this poor Haitian girl from, you know, Florida. And so I was like, okay, so who knows somebody who may know somebody who may know somebody in the WHO? And that's how I, you know, packaged my, my application and focus, made my determinations. I want to go to WHO. And I kept asking and asking until finally my application landed in somebody's desk at WHO. They opened it and they said, ah. Oh, Yes. Right. And I went to the WHO. So, and, um, you know, during that summer, I got to intern um, in their department that focuses on um, humanitarian relief, the humanitarian um, crises. And I did a project focused on lessons learned from the Haiti earthquake. Amazing. It was an amazing experience. Um, and then, you know, continued on and graduated. I barely passed my step ones. Again, standardized tests, uh, they're not, they're not my friend, but it doesn't matter because that weakness did not stop me from getting to where I want to be, right? We all have weaknesses. We all do, right? But it's not about harping on your weaknesses. It's focusing on your strengths. Um, so jump ahead. Now I'm an emergency medicine physician. Um, I'm located in Florida. And so I had to create another impossible dream, right? You know, um, so what's my newest impossible dream? Well, my newest impossible dream is taking on this mission focus on the wellness of healthcare professionals, you know, throughout the US and the entire world. And so I, um, in addition to being an emergency medicine doctor, in addition to being a mom, you know, um, I now created my company and my company is called uh, Hope for Med. And it's focused is on the wellness of, of healthcare professionals in the U.S. and, and abroad. Um, because what I didn't know, and I don't know if any of you guys want to be doctors or, you know, work in the healthcare arena, is it's tough, right? And I didn't really understand how hard it is, um, you know, how hard the day-to-day -day is. Um, you know, I, I I had no doctors. I mean, my parents didn't go to college. I had no doctors in my family. I had nothing, right? So I entered into medicine based off of what I was seeing on TV, right? And um, I had a great show called Grey's Anatomy that I loved. Oh my gosh, Grey's Anatomy. I do potlucks, um, you know, potluck dinners with Grey's Anatomy. Hey, all my friends come over, we watch this drama. And that was my introduction to medicine just to find out that medicine is nothing like Grey's Anatomy. It was such a letdown, right? Um, you know, but the, but the reality of the situation is that it's tough um, and there isn't support for the people that are providing the care and the people that are providing the care are suffering. Um, and, and it completely, you know, going into medicine really completely changes you. Um, and you kind of have to find yourself, but you have to, um, focus and, and, and be determined to find yourself. Um, you know, you, you, you leave it oftentimes shells of who you are, you're bitter, you're angry. Um, and there's a lot of death, um, in this field, um, you're surrounded by death, but um, we as healthcare professionals are also dying. So because of that, you know, my new mission is to tackle that. That's my impossible dream. So now tell me, what's yours? All right, good question. 
who has a possible dream that they want to share with Dr. JB? All right, TR. First of all, thank you guys for allowing me to be a part of this. I'm sorry I was late. I had some computer issues earlier and could get in, but I have had several conversations with Dr. JB and was excited to hear her with a mic in front of her again for reasons that she and I both know. The Impossible Dream, my last Toastmaster speech, and I've talked to Stan about Toastmasters and Angela as well, and so great to see all of you. My last Toastmasters speech, the first line of it started this way. <clears throat> At the very young and tender age of 66, I am deciding to move from a lifetime of employment to a life's journey of deployment in the field of professional speaking. So I've never done it before. I've, I came from a culture where they teach you that to be successful, you must go to college, get a good education, get a job, and you typically stay on that job for the rest of your life in my age group, not in yours. <laughs> that was my age group. But that does not work. That formula is not congruent with the way mankind works in this day and time. So now I have the privilege of being alive. I'm an empty nester. My wife and I, after 43, let's say 43 years of marriage this year, kids are gone. So now I get to go back to my dreams of 22 and do it. And I'm inspired by Dr. JB's testimonies of continuously remaking herself, uh, redeveloping, finding her roots, digging new holes to plant new seeds in her life. Um, there are some others that she left out that I'm aware of, but there's a whole lot of things that she has done and truly all of those are inspirations to all of us. And thank you very much, Dr. JB, for sharing. Thank you. Dr. J JB, I have a question for you. When you, uh, you developed your impossible dream, you knew what it was that you wanted to challenge. How, when you ran across those obstacles, those walls that were just right in front of you, how did you overcome them? What did you do to overcome them? Mm. So, you know, it's, I would be lying if I said I didn't get discouraged, right? But that is why you need to share your impossible dream with others, right? And you don't share your impossible dream with others that are going to be naysayers and say, oh, you can't do it or whatever, because that's just, you need, you need a supportive community. You need a community that says, you know, um, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you can, right? That's all you really need, right? Because we are human and we're going to doubt ourselves and we're going to say, I don't know, maybe this is too big of a, a bite. You know, maybe I need to take a smaller bite. Maybe I need to come, you know, with a, uh, you know, not such a big dream, you know, and you need to, to um, be surrounded by people that say, no, if you can think it, if you can think it, you can make it happen. Um, but these dreams are not stuff that happens overnight, right? Like, it's not like, oh, I want to be a doctor and I became a doctor tomorrow, right? It's, it's a journey and it's, and it's not an easy journey, um, but it's a journey that you just have to continuously, you know, redetermine and find your community, um, you know, create that community for you. And it doesn't have to be a lot of people. It could just be one person, right? One person that you guys lean on each other, right? Um, but find that person so that you can help each other stand when you falter. Good point. Good point. Yeah, sometimes the people that are closest to us will be the people that will shoot our dreams down the quickest, okay? So we've got to be careful sometimes about sharing our, sharing our dreams with the people that are closest to us. And you were very wise to find that support, you know, group or that support individual or you know, if you can expand beyond that, believe in the dream and believe in yourself, regardless of where you're at, what it is that you have to overcome, as I know that you can do. Who else has a question for Dr. JB or would like to share your own possible dream? Conrad? Yes, 
Thank you so very much, Dr. Debbie. I really appreciate and I'm so humbled to have learned a lot of uh, information from you. On my side, the impossible dream, uh, I'll just start with my impossible dream. I think it was one time when I left my employment and I started uh, working on my own. This was uh, at a point where I were in lockdown during COVID-19 and the whole country was uh, locked down. No one was allowed to, to move. Maybe if you're to travel, you have to move on foot. I was in Kampala, my home village is in Ibarra. So that is when I left my employment. That's when I left my job. And I was just home, stranded. Uh, I couldn't get like, yes, I could get a meal, but I was not really sure about the next meal or the next day, but yes, I tried so hard. I started up my own small company. This was something that I had thought about, but since I had done IT, I thought of designing graphics. So I would do graphics and then send small flyers to my friends. And I started marketing myself on social media and I would get small money that would at least sustain me for a day that would maybe uh, give me hopes for the next day. And then with that, I started on pushing. I found that to be my uh, career because since then I decided not to work for maybe any other uh, company or maybe for government. And I started up my own company that does websites and graphics right now. And of course, with support of friends that I met within that time, Standard Inclusive and Angela, uh, we started working together. That's how we also kept on pushing educational missions by then. And now here we are. One question that I have for Dr. JB, uh, it is what motivated you most of the times because I see you're traveling to Uganda. How do you even travel to Uganda without money? How do you join uh, maybe WHO without even knowing someone that what was exactly pushing you so hard all that time? Did you watch motivational stories? Like you said, when you're going to, uh, to study, be a doctor, you just watched it on TV, but was just watching it on TV enough? Did you do research? Did you just wake up one day and you're like, I'll be a doctor because I saw someone who's a doctor? What was really pushing you and motivating you within that time? Thank you. Great question. So what was my driving force? Well, you know, my driving force was, you know, realizing that there's so much more to life than what I've been able to experience growing up um, poor, right? Poor in this country. And, um, and I wanted to climb as high as I can climb. Now, am I at the end? Uh, I don't think so. I'm not going to be at the end until I die, right? I'm going to continuously climb because I want to see personally how high can I climb, right? Because I know what the bottom is. You know, I probably wasn't really at the bottom, bottom, because again, I told you we always had food, you know, may have not have been much, but I had food. And, you know, it might've been leftovers for a couple of days, but it was food, right? Not moldy yet. Um, and the shelter, right? And I know that there are other people that don't have that, right? So I'm not gonna say that I came from the bottom because I that, that would really be the bottom, right? But I was pretty low. I was low on the ladder and I climbed. And when I climbed one step, that first step, that first victory, no matter how small that is, right? Allowed me to be like, oh, I did that. I did that. Look, I climbed the step, right? And then you can use that to be like, oh, what will it look like if I do the next step? Because I know I can because I did that first one, right? So it's looking for those small wins, those small wins and finding another small win and another small win, right? You keep adding them up. You're like, oh, I did that. I did this. I did that. I did this. And before you know it, right? It's not about necessarily thinking about, oh, this is a big pie. I want to eat. You know, it's about, oh, this little piece I ate, and let me eat this little piece, and let me eat this little piece. And before you know it, you ate the whole entire pie, right? And that's really how you do it. And that's how you don't get discouraged because the, the big pie is really overwhelming. But the small piece, I can do that small piece. 
Well, you're absolutely right. One step can lead to the next step, can lead to the next step, can lead to the next step. The problem that we face sometimes is we will we will not take that first step because of fear. You know, when the children of Israelite were were being chased by Pharaoh and things, you know, the Red Sea didn't part. Okay, it didn't part until they put their foot in the water. Okay. It wasn't until they put their foot in the water that the waters parted, okay? And that's what Dr. JB is telling us, is that you've got to put your foot in the water. You just got to go forward, you know, boom. I've heard a saying one time of, uh, of things being what they call a paper curtain, okay? It looks like a massive wall, okay, that would stop you. But in reality, it's just sort of a paper curtain. You know, sometimes the biggest obstacles in our lives that we're facing look huge, all right? But in reality, we can bust right through them. It's only huge in our imagination. It's only huge in our, you, you know, the things that we're thinking. And we just got to go forward and bust through there. And busting through may be easier than what you think. It's almost like a dam. If we have, we've dammed up a river and a dam gets one little small uh, pinhole in it, that pinhole will open up and open up and open up until the whole dam releases everything that's been held back and that river comes rushing forward. And that's the way things occur in our life also. All right, do we have somebody else has some words of wisdom for us? Would like to share something? Yes, TR. My warning is you don't offer a preacher a microphone. You're in danger every time you do that. But I will control myself. I'd like to simply share something that I shared on LinkedIn this morning. It is a quote from a person that I consider a mentor and hero. It reads, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 great games, 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that's why I succeed. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. For you guys, he's a tremendous basketball player for everybody. Michael knows. Jordan. Michael Jordan. There's, he, he says, I succeed because I'm not afraid of the moment of failure. Failure is my teacher. I simply, I learned, we learn more when we fail than when we succeed. If you fail at something, you'll go back and watch the film again and see what you did. If you win, you, you just go on. You take the right. trophy and you walk away. But when you fail, you keep on. And I say this, we have to be encouraged. None of us came out of the womb running. We all came out the same way. But now all of us, as I look around the room here, are walking. But we look good now but we did a lot of falling, a lot of crawling, a lot of crying, a lot of help me ups before we learn to walk. Life is like that in everything you do. There'll be a lot of crawling and crying and falling and help me ups. But if you keep doing it, the gift is inside of you. You don't know it but your parents knew it. So they kept pushing you to keep trying. And that's what your life is, will always be about. Always be about. Again, thank you, Dr. B, Dr. JB. And thank you, Stan. Thank you for that word of encouragement. Eddie Jack, I see you got your hand up there. Go ahead and share with us. Oh, good evening, everyone. I hope uh, you people are okay. I'm happy to hear from a doctor. Thank you so much. Uh, first things first, you have an amazing baby. 
Mm. Yeah, we're all appreciated. Mm. It's good to have babies. Uh, all I can say this evening is that uh, I watched a video. Is something like Martin Luther King, this guy, an American guy, he said, if you have to, to run, if you cannot run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But you must keep moving. I've seen that. And uh, there is no way you can fail when you have not started. You have to start and fail. Or you cannot reach in the middle when you have not started. That's all I learned. Uh, if you want to start something, you have to start. When you're starting, you know either you will win or you will not win, but you will have learned. You know where you're going. You reach in the middle. And uh, all I can say, the moment you have reached in the middle, you cannot go back because the beginning is always the most difficult thing. So, Thank you so much. Uh, we are motivated. We are happy you came to Uganda. You saw the, the, the situation people live in. <laughs> you even went to Marara, the Conrad's home, really. You must have had an amazing time in Uganda. And uh, thank you for motivating us. We are really inspired. Keep moving and may God bless you. Thank you very much, Eddie and Jack. We appreciate that very kindly. Uh, would you invite her back to Uganda? I see Conrad shaking his head. What about it, Eddie Jack? Is she yes, uh, I, I would really 100% uh, <laughs> invite her back to Uganda. If she ever gets an opportunity, then I'll be so happy to meet her in person. Well, good. We'll keep her busy going lots of places, doing lots of things. So you do have an open invitation to uh, come to Uganda and make that one of your impossible dreams. Come back, come back now that you're an official doctor, okay, and see the difference you're going to make. All right, it's 12.02, guys. Yes, Dr. J. One uh, final quote that I encountered recently. Can you hear me? That I think is really important. So it's, it's now one of my... Uh, quotes live by and it's um it says it's not how you start that's important but how you finish one final word newman we're glad to have you with us we appreciate it very very much this is the first time i think i have seen you here so thank you dl always good to see you uh bona maybe pronouncing your your name wrong i hope hope not but uh anyhow you're an amazing young man. You need to get together with Conrad so we can have you as a guest speaker here, okay? We need to get that, you need to get that scheduled on here. Guys, we're a little bit over time. We are going to make sure that you send it out. I just put that uh, link on the chat. So if you want to get the, the link that we're going to be watching again next week on how to solve problems, okay? If you can grab that real quick before we end everything, that will, that will be good. Uh, Thank you, guys. Newman, did you have any words that you wanted to say to us? I see you thinking. Just give us a thumbs up then. All right, good. Glad to have you with us. Feel free anytime to, uh, to speak. Guys, we're gonna call it uh, a uh, evening. Dr. JB, thank you so very, very, very much. You're making a difference in everything. We'll learn to uh, dream the impossible dream. Actually, on, our, on the dive that we that we teach, we use in our in our book, we talk about the impossible dream is like on side four and how we can do the impossible. And of course, that's just by having a systematic approach to dealing with one little thing at a time and another little thing at a time, and we can figure out. Yeah, there's our, there's our book right there that uh, Think to Prosper, all right? We'll have to send you a copy of it, and uh, we'll send PR a copy of it, too. Anybody else that needs one, we can get that on out to you. So anyhow, thank you, guys. We'll see you next Tuesday. Please tell as many, many friends as, as possible, okay? Hi, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Bye, guys. Love you all. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>
All right, a minute for all. They were disappearing. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you being here, buddy. Good to see you, everybody. All right, there we go. I'm, I'm fixing to push the button. <laughs>